So good morning and welcome to Queensbury. I'm Chris, one of the leaders here, and I'll be joined this morning by two of our other leaders, Sally and Lynn. Whether this is your first time with us or you're returning once again, be it on Zoom or on YouTube afterwards, we give you a warm welcome. We hope that you'll find time this morning to spend in the presence of God and to celebrate his glory. We're going to continue this week with our series of working hand in hand with God. And Pete will be sharing God's word with us from Joshua chapter two, where we will discover that no one is beyond the reach of God's grace. So before we start, let's pray. Lord, let us not be a spectator or a bystander this morning. Lord, we pray that we will be an active participant as we seek to worship and praise you. Lord, would you just pour out your blessings as we come together to celebrate life in all its fullness. Lord, bless us with the anointing of your Holy Spirit as we receive the grace of love and mercy that you have poured out for us on the cross of Calvary. Lord, would you just open our ears to hear this morning and open our eyes to see the truth of your word as we turn to you. Lord, we come to you this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Yes, Lord, we give thanks that it's your love that brings us together this morning. And would you just hold us close, surround us with your love, and bring us ever closer. And just lead us with your spirit as we continue this morning. Amen. So some notices to share with you before we continue. Um, as I'm sure you'll all be aware, we received news this week on the restrictions that uh, we're going to be facing in the weeks ahead as we hopefully come out of this pandemic. And as leaders, we met to decide what we should do as a church as we progress in, in the weeks ahead. Um, and so led by the guidance of the Baptist Union, um, we have taken the decision that church buildings will remain closed until some, at least the 29th of March. Um, so pray. Pray that uh, during that time, uh, we can continue to share in his word. We can share in his majesty in the hope that we can all come together once again on that Easter weekend that follows the 29th of March. Also to update you on our progress with Claire uh, and to thank all of you that took time to send messages uh, and to share with us your thoughts and feelings following last Sunday's service. I'm delighted to inform you that we've invited Claire to come to Nottingham uh, on the weekend of the 14th of March, uh, where we'll be broadcasting our service live from church. Um, unfortunately, we can't invite you to be with us as a congregation, but we do hope uh, that as many of you as possible will join us on Zoom and afterwards on YouTube as Claire joins us. Uh, and a reminder that for those of you that can't join us on Zoom or can't join us afterwards on YouTube, uh, we will make recordings available. Um, so please do let others know um, if they're not able to join online, um, we can make arrangements to share those recordings with one another. And uh, importantly, there will be a church members meeting that will follow on Monday, the 15th of March. And so that'll be held online. And I encourage as many of you as possible uh, to come as we discuss where we head next uh, with Claire as we continue to look for a pastor for our church. Finally, before we uh, head further into today's service, uh, I invite you to read ahead in preparation for next Sunday, uh, Joshua chapter three and chapter four, as Michael will be preaching on these two chapters. Um, we won't necessarily have full time to read the, the whole text in the service. So to really get the most from that service, I encourage you to read those two chapters this week. Uh, I'm just going to invite Sally now to share with us an update on baby Eliza. Thank you, Sally. Um, here's an update from Mark. Thank you for your continued prayers for baby Eliza. She's likely to stay in hospital for at least one more week, if not more, as she continues to recover from the lack of oxygen that she had at birth. The doctors keep looking for other reasons she was so ill, but all tests so far haven't found anything. Recent concerns about her liver and seizures have been answered by tests and monitoring and all seems okay, so that's, that's good. Um, she just needs time to recover and to learn to feed from mum. The physio is pleased to see her moving like any baby should, so we're hopeful of a complete recovery, though still worried about potential seizures and how she'll develop over the next two years. A consultant will be monitoring her. And uh, so, Thanks for your prayers. Don't stop. Let's press in and uh, support Mark and Naomi and this little family as they move forwards and progress. Let's worship again together in song.
morning, everybody. It's lovely to be here. And I just want to read something that I believe is from the Lord for all of us. So just imagine that it's the Lord speaking to you. It may sound very different to how I sound, but just imagine this word is just for, for you. And it's titled, I will do the impossible for you. The love I have for you is endless. It endures beyond the days of your life and finds its completion in eternity. My love has stepped out of heaven and stepped into your life. I will intensify your experience of my love as you seek more of me. Is there something in front of you that looks impossible? Are the hearts of others unyielding to me? Is your family surrounded by difficulty and stress? I will do the impossible for you, for my love will win the day. What seems to be hard, I will make easy for you. When it looks like everything has blocked your way and there is no one near to help you, I will make it easy for you. When it appears to you that you are always letting go and walking into more difficulty, I promise I will make it easy for you. Grace will always empower you to sacrifice your personal wishes as you worship in my presence. Strength replaces weakness. Grace floods into your impossibility and I will make it easy for you. The burden you carry must be laid down as you take up my easy yoke and learn more of me. I will enrich your soul, inflame your heart and give you a greater joy. Come into my sacred chamber where every sacrifice becomes sweeter than honey and every loss becomes gaining more of me. I will do the impossible for you, for you are the focus of my attention and the apple of my eye. I will love you into victory until what seems hard becomes the way of grace and glory. Song of Songs, chapter eight, verse six and seven, place this fierce unrelenting fire over your entire being. Rivers of pain and persecution will never extinguish this flame. Endless floods will be unable to quench this raging fire that burns within you. Everything will be consumed. It will stop at nothing as you yield everything to this furious fire until, until it won't even seem to you like a sacrifice anymore. Song of Songs describes God's love for us as an unquenchable fire. Imagine just standing in front of that fire and just throwing all the impossibilities into that fire, into the flame, and see all them impossibilities go up in flames. Then thank God that, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Lord, I thank you that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And I pray for all of us, all my brothers and sisters in Christ, myself, for all of us in your church today, Lord, those that aren't here, those that haven't been able to make the meeting. I pray today, Lord, that we will learn something new of you. I pray, Lord, that we will all have heart revelation of the impossibilities that you want to get rid of for us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that, that, that as the word is spoken today, your love will come cascading down into hearts, Lord. And I pray, Lord, where people just don't believe that you love them, that, that they will have heart revelation of just how much you love them, Lord. I pray, Lord, that, that, that love and passion will 
arise in people's hearts today, Father. It don't matter how, how long we've been in church, Lord. We all need to, to encounter your love daily. And I pray, Lord, that's what will happen today. I pray, Lord, that, that your love will just set hearts ablaze today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done. We thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. And, and Lord, we thank you for, for how you've shown up in little Eliza's life, Lord. Continue your good work, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that you who begins a good work will bring it to completion. Lord, I pray for Eliza and her family, for Mark and Naomi, Lord, that they will be a family that will say, look what God has done. Lord, we lay everything at the foot of the cross. But I pray for each of us now, Lord, that we, as your people, will be filled with that fiery love for one another, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that you route out the, the what's not supposed to be in our hearts, Lord. But thank you, Lord, that <clears throat> if we love one another as you say we do, then people will see that we're yours, Lord. Lord, I pray as Peter brings the word now, Lord, that that, that will pierce our hearts and we will all look at grace afresh. Have your way in this service, Lord. Your kingdom come and your will be done. And I pray that in Jesus Christ's mighty name. Amen. So our reading this morning is from the book of Joshua and it's chapter two. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out this land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out your men who came, the men who came to you and entered your house because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman who had taken the two men and hidden them and she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. I don't know where, which way they went. Go after them quickly, you may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, who you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts sank and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the men assured her, if you don't tell what we're doing. If you don't tell what we're doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. 
she said to them, go to the hills so that the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there for three days until they return and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land, you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into your house. If any of them go outside your house onto the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we're doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and they stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Good morning, my QVC friends. It's so good to see you and to have a chance to talk on uh, Joshua 2 in your series on working hand in hand with God. And I've come this morning to a beautiful place near where I live. Um, it's an arboretum. It's a beautiful spring morning, very different weather to last time, my friends. And I've come here because this arboretum has been planted on the site of a prisoner of war camp from during the war. And in these beautiful grounds were stationed and were kept captive prisoners who were either of German national descent as seen as a threat to national security or suspected spies who were kept here while their cases were investigated. And it just strikes me that in Joshua chapter 2, we're coming off the back of a triumphal declaration over Joshua of God telling him to be strong and courageous and even the people telling him to be strong and courageous and yet the whole of chapter two is about sneaking around in the dark and spying and it seems a bit strange but there's stuff to be dug down into here as we'll see there's good reason why Joshua wanted to send those spies and anyway he only figures in the first and last verses of the chapter the central character is Rahab and we see how God is able through his providence to make himself known to those who are hearing him and to give them the faith to put all their trust in him to work hand in hand with him from whatever they've come through to wherever he wants to lead them so we're going to look at three things this morning we're going to look at Joshua working in hand in hand with God and how God was able to use all his past and previous experiences and workings with God to bring everything together to work with him in the right way at the right moment. And we're going to look at Rahab and how her hearing stories of God's wondrous plan led her to be willing to put everything she had, all her trust, into him. That he could work hand in hand with her for her salvation and ultimately even put her in the heritage line of Jesus himself. And we're going to think about that in terms of what it means for us to tell tales of God, to put all our all into his hands and to be the means of rescue for those who are looking for a way out. So I pray that this morning, as we study this chapter together, that God would give you confidence in his greatness, that he would give you confidence that wherever you feel you are right now, he has been with you and been working with you and can use all that he has done in your life for his glory and your good, even at this point. That you can have confidence in him and put all your trust and hope in him. And as you do so, you can take his hand in your hands and put it in the hand of others who really need him. 
So, Lord, would you bless us as we study your word, we pray in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. So all this spying, well, as you may know, Joshua had a bit of previous with spying. You read in the book of Numbers how when God led the people of Israel out of Egypt, in a very short space of time, he led them towards the edge of the promised land and told Moses to choose one spy from each of the tribes to go in and see what was waiting for them. And they found a land of bounty and beauty. Um, they talked about it flowing with milk and honey, a uh, good pastoral land to grow crops, a great place to live. But they also found tribes of ferocious fighting people whom many of the spies described as giants. They were filled with fear. Now Joshua and his fellow spy Caleb urged the people to rally behind God and rally behind Moses. They knew that if they were going to work hand in hand with God, then it was God's hands that were most important, not theirs. The reaction of most of the people to this was to stone them. But God's reaction to this was to label and declare that that generation was wicked and disloyal and disobedient and that they would never enter the kingdom of God. And so 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and a generation disappearing then ensued in the story. And now here Joshua is again, just him and Caleb left. And it's completely natural, I guess, that he would want to both see what the lie of the land was now, 40 years later, and also to see what the reaction of the people would be to the same sort of news. So this time he chooses two spies. I wonder if he was thinking of himself and Caleb. And he sends them in. And they return with a very different story. They return having met Rahab. And Rahab, who we'll look at a bit later, tells them that the story of God has gone before them, that they have heard about all the wonderful things that God has done, his power, his strength, his might. And this time, even if the people might be the size of giants, they're melting away in fear. So the spies go back to Joshua, who we only hear about in the very first verse and the very last verse of this chapter. And they report this, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting away in fear before us. What joy that must have brought to his heart. How different it must feel this time. I wonder if he thought of all of those who have died. I wonder if he thought of Moses at that point. If he thought about all the lessons that the Lord had taught them in the desert over that time and wondered at how God had brought them to this point where now he was going to work with them, they were going to work with him, and the land he had promised them would finally be delivered to them through his mighty hand. So as we look at this story, as we consider now both Joshua in his role as leader and Rahab as one who discovers God through this, Let's think about us working in hand in hand with God over a long period of time. It might not have been 40 years, but I wonder if you've been waiting for the Lord to act in a particular way. Or I wonder if right now you have a decision where you would like to be strong and courageous, like Joshua was being encouraged to be, both by God and by people. And yet you fear that ahead of you waits a land full of giants. Well, what Joshua found is firstly that God is faithful. He never changes. What he promises, he delivers. And if he needs to wait for us to be ready, then he will. But his promises are faithful and his promises are true. And secondly, that he can use all that he has done in our lives up to this point. He can use our failures. He can use our successes. He can use the delays. He can use the moment right now. So if you've got a decision that you're putting off making, if there's a, uh, a big moment coming up in your life that's looming, 
If you feel right now that you're under siege by people the size of giants, or insurmountable city walls, or barriers that are not crossable on your own, then you're probably right. But remember, as you work hand in hand with God, it's not your hands that are important, it's His. So can you hear God's promise to you? Be strong and be courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. So if that's Joshua, then what about Rahab, who becomes the central character in this chapter that's named after Joshua? And she becomes uh, an absolute legend in Hebrew history. She says three incredible things in her verses that make clear to us what faith she was putting in this God. We read in verse 8, that she says to the spies who've gone to her house, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. So here was a woman who got to see and hear tales from all sorts of visitors. It's no wonder really that if the spies wanted to find out what was really going on, they really wanted to know what the lie of the land was, what the mood music that was playing in Jericho at the time was, that they would go to Rahab's house, the brothel. This is where guards would be let down, where things would be said, where tales would be told. And perhaps as foreigners, they could um, not have so many questions asked after them. But Rahab has heard. She says that she knows that the Lord has given the land. And when she notices a chance maybe to get an escape, to get a way out, it is because of her knowledge of the Lord and who he is and what he's done. We know that because in verse 11, Rahab says, when we heard, our hearts sank and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on the earth below. She has no doubt here that their God is God and that if he has decided that Jericho is to be destroyed, then it will be destroyed. And she has no hope other than in the Lord God himself. So when the spies come up with their plan with her, that she must agree to keep them safe at risk to her own life, that when she agrees to their plan for the Scarlet Cord, and she can only leave with her family. She has no doubts. Agreed, she replied in verse 21. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed. And she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Now this is an incredible act of faith. What Rahab is saying is stronger than the city walls, stronger than the army that would defend her, stronger than all the gods of her people, stronger than her community ties, stronger than her loyalty to her country, her friends, anyone other than her immediate family, she is going to throw her entire lot in with God, with what she has heard, with the tales that she has come to hear. Now the rest of Jericho are quaking in fear. That is the other reaction to what God is doing. It's just one of blind terror. The hopes that their armies, their hands will be enough. But Rahab is putting all her eggs in the basket of her faith in these spies and through them in God himself. And perhaps we need to see here that God will work hand in hand with us, but he works best when our hands are empty. So I think this asks us two questions. Firstly, as we seek to work with God and ask him to work in our lives, are we able, like Rahab was, to throw our full lot in with him? 
Do we have a pile of stuff? Are we relying also on our finances, on our friends, on our wisdom, on our education, on our job, on our pension pot, on our health, on our plans, on our wisdom? Some of those can be God-given. We're called to be good stewards of all of those things. But are we willing to relabel them as God's? Are we willing to put them all at his service and say, I know that the Lord is God, that I will put my faith in you, that I will agree with you, let it be as you say. And as we do so, God will take our empty hands in his magnificent cosmic hands and who knows what he can unleash in us. So, we've looked at Joshua and how he had his hand in God's hand for years and God was able to use all those experiences, all that waiting to his ultimate glory in Joshua's life at the right point in the right way. And we thought about Rahab and her willingness to empty her hands of all she'd held onto in order to take God's hand and press forward. And finally, I want to think about that scarlet thread. So I've come to a part of the Arboretum where there's a road running down the side. You might hear some traffic or some sirens amongst the dogs, dogs barking and the birds tweeting at the moment. That road marks the county boundary. It's where Leicestershire County becomes Leicester City. And you really notice it in winter around this time of year because the two authorities have very different gritting policies. So you can be driving your car perfectly well down one road and then suddenly you come to the T-junction where the roads cross and suddenly it's snowy or icy. There's no gritting done. The authority of one area ends and the authority of another area begins. Now, when we meet Rahab, she's living in the city wall. She's right on the edge. She's right on the edge of the city and its safety in human terms. And then that land that has been promised under God's terms to his people. And what she really needs is a way out. She needs a way of escape. She's heard of God. She's heard of what he's done. She believes in him. She's willing to put everything into him. And now she needs a means, of, a means of escape. And that comes through the Scarlet Thread. And the Scarlet Thread is one of those beautiful things that runs right the way through scripture. Where could you trace it back to? How about the blood that was shed when the skins were ripped off the animals and the clothes thrown onto Adam and Eve in their sin as they left the Garden of Eden? And then the blood of the lamb that's put on the doorposts of the people of Israel as the Spirit of God goes over Egypt, taking the life of the firstborn and leading to their freedom and being commemorated then in the Passover every year that they remember what the Lord has done for them. And then a scarlet thread was woven into the high priest's garment over his heart for the, um, the garment that he wore whenever he prayed for the people of Israel. And there was a, a scarlet cord woven into the curtain that separated the people from God in the Holy of Holies, his presence in the temple that then was ripped in two when the scarlet blood of Jesus was shed on the cross for all of us. And maybe that scarlet thread was then passed on to us by someone through our parents, through friends, through family, through creation, through God's amazing plan to rescue each one of us. Each one of us has been handed a scarlet thread of salvation that guarantees our redemption, our safety, our ownership, our belonging to him, our means of rescue. That same means of rescue that came to Rahab. Perhaps in your Bible at the bottom there's a footnote saying that um, prostitute can also be translated as publican or housekeeper. Well, that's not really credible or tenable. The reason that that's there is because at one point translations found it so hard to believe that a prostitute could be honoured in the way that Rahab was, accepted in the way that she was, even in the genealogy, even in the heritage of Jesus himself. 
they had to find a way that she was more acceptable. Yet what made her acceptable was her willingness to put her faith in God and to take the offer that he gave her of that scarlet cord. So I ask you this week, would you accept anyone that God was rescuing? When we all get back, when we're able to sit next to each other, when we're able to meet as a community, our job is to make sure that we lovingly accept and disciple and journey with anyone that has managed to grab God's rescue. It's our job to offer that scarlet cord to them through any kind of seeker events or alpha or our conversations, our telling of the amazing things that God has done, just like Rahab had heard the amazing things God has done. So I wonder if this week, pick a day when you are going to see people, if you don't get out of the house much, perhaps a day you go shopping or you, you get to go for a walk where you know you'll, you'll meet other dog walkers or other people. It's a crazy idea. But could you wear something scarlet? Could you wear a, a scarlet necklace or um, a scarlet thread around your wrist? Something that might draw a comment or a question or just give a reminder for you that everybody you meet needs God. Everybody you meet is included in Jesus' wonderful rescue plan. If someone notices what you're wearing, perhaps you could pray they would before you go out then you can maybe share why you're wearing it. It's a reminder that God wants everybody to know him and there is a means by which they can. If no one speaks to you, then perhaps it will just remind you to pray for the people you walk past, perhaps the people you would normally not notice and pray for a heart that accepts all those that God chooses to include in his kingdom, in his rescue. So I pray for you, church. I pray for you, my friends, that as you go through this week, you may again recommit to working hand in hand with God, that you may offer to him and surrender him all that he has done in your life up to this point and ask him to use it for his glory right now. That you might again be willing to put all that you have at his service and re-surrender to him as Christ your Lord and that you might be willing to be the means by which others hear that point of rescue that you might know that he will work hand in hand with you to build his kingdom and to work his purposes because his hands are mighty and he chooses to take our hands in his in Jesus name Amen We're going to respond to what we've just heard, heard there um, with the worship song, This Is Amazing Grace. I make no apologies that we're going to spend a full seven minutes as we sit in the presence of God and we sing this song. And it might be you sing this song as a way of celebrating in thankfulness the acceptance of that grace in your life. Or it might be you want to just sit quietly and pray that you would share that grace that you've acknowledged with somebody else. Or perhaps for you, you're yet to take that step of accepting that grace and, and maybe you recognise there's things in your life that you perceive as getting in the way of accepting that grace and as we've just heard nothing nothing gets in the way that grace is free for all let's join together as we sing this is amazing grace Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the 
King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love that you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me as we, we we've sung there that that amazing truth that amazing grace that is on offer to all of us that those of you that are watching online afterwards might be touched by that um if you've not yet accepted that that you'll be called to just pick up a phone to drop us an email at hello at qbc to know more because we'd be delighted to share more of that truth with you. I invite you all to join us again next week when Michael will be continuing our series of working hand in hand with God and will be bringing us the word from Joshua chapter three and chapter four, where we will learn that God wants us to bear witness to his work. A reminder that if you have the opportunity please do read those chapters in advance of next weekend. So today we discovered something of the amazing grace that is on offer to every single one of us.
there's an expression that to err is human, but to forgive is divine. So maybe you're watching this and you think you're beyond this amazing gift that's on offer. If this is you, as I've said before, I invite you to come and join us again to learn and discover more. The Bible is full of stories of people that have lost their way. And let me reassure you, we all have moments when trusting God is hard. We've all fallen down. We've all fallen short. But what sets our faith apart from all of the faiths is that assurance that when we fall, when we stumble, we can reach out our hands and let God pick us back up again. Those never tiring hands of forgiveness. So as you head into the week ahead, when doubt starts to creep in, when your faith stutters or grows weak, don't be disheartened. Many great men and women of faith before us have experienced much worse and fallen much further. Trust in Jesus this week to do what he was sent and came to do. To forgive, to restore and to strengthen us in all we do. Know that Christ is good and wants good things for us all, no matter where we find ourselves. It all starts with that step of faith. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. And these are the words of our Saviour and grace, Jesus Christ. Ask, believe, and trust in him. In Jesus' name, amen.